Hi everyone, and welcome to our lunch series presentation, pre presentation featuring Bill Reiner on the forest flora of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. I'm Judith Allen, the operations coordinator at Travis Audubon. If you're already a member, we thank you so much for your support of our mission to inspire conservation through birding. If you're not yet a member, we welcome you and encourage you to become one. We really appreciate the ways that you're supporting Travis Audubon, even when we can't be together. We want to let you know that registration has officially opened for our virtual Victor Emanuel Conservation Award celebration, honoring Sheila Hargis. Registration for this event is free. Invite your friends. We will post the link in the chat box shortly. A few housekeeping items before we get started. If you haven't already, please turn off your video and mute your microphone. This will help us minimize distractions. Throughout the presentation, you're welcome to enter comments or ask any questions into the chat box. We should have some time at the end of the presentation to address any questions you have. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Bill Reiner, who will be talking about different forest communities found within the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, with a focus on plant species that may serve as indicators of each type of community. He will also be discussing the less common plant species, especially those that are endemic to Texas or more narrowly to a few counties on the Edwards Plateau. Bill, whenever you're ready, we are very excited to hear from you today. All right, am I coming through? You're all good. All right, great, thank you. <laughs> this is kind of weird. I haven't done this before. And it's kind of weird not being able to see any of you all, but I'm really glad you were able to come and uh, join in on this lecture. Uh, it's also kind of weird to be able to, I've been on Zoom meetings before, but seeing it from backstage is kind of, kind of thrilling. It's kind of interesting way of doing things. Um, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time um, chit chat stuff because I've got a lot of slides to talk about here. Um, as you may have been able to tell from the introduction and the title of the presentation, I uh, will not be talking about birds, uh, or very, very little about birds in this presentation. Uh, I want to focus, uh, of course, on the plants of the Bakunis Canyonlands Preserve that's on the outskirts of Austin, Texas here. Um, now, of course, birds depend upon plants. Birds live in communities of plants. So the plants do affect the birds. Um, but most of the birds that are found in forest or woodland communities will be found in all of the communities I'll be talking about today. There's not a lot of distinction. Um, a species may gravitate toward one layer of the forest, such as the canopy, the midstory, the shrub layer, or the ground layer or on openings uh, within the forest, but I've seen little segregation among the species between the two major forest types and two uh, niche communities that I wanna talk about today. So uh, that's what I'm talking about. It's gonna be two major forest communities uh, that are found on the preserve and um, two niche communities that are found within those major communities. Uh, but they have distinctive plants that are found within them and I wanted to highlight those, particularly for two reasons. I had, uh, um, I've heard so many times the, the, the myth that, there, that most of the Austin area was once uh, grassland, uh, savanna and grassland, and, and there certainly was grassland in this area, but there were extensive forests as well. Um, and uh, indication of that is not only uh, the historical record of people who first arrived in this area from Europe, um, but also the presence of not only golden cheek warbler, which is very much uh, requires extensive forest, but a lot of different plants also that are forest uh, adapted plants that are found nowhere else in the United States or else in the world. Uh, they're very, very limited range. So they give a good indication that, yeah, there was quite a bit of forest in this area as well. Um, um, the uh, classifications that I'm using here are not definitive. Um, they are 
Um, I'm having trouble getting my screen to move here. Where are we going? There we go. Um, that's why I subtitled this presentation, Observations of a Field Biologist. Um, I'm not a professional ecologist, I'm a field biologist. Um, I take a lot of the, um, uh, some of the cues of this from some of the ecological literature I've read, including some popular literature. If you're familiar with the Peterson series on the ecology of Eastern forests and the ecology of Western forests, a lot of the terminology I'm using and a lot of the framework I'm using is, is similar to that, though uh, I don't actually quote any of the material from that book. This is all pretty much my stuff. Um, um, but since we're talking about the Balcones Canyons Preserve, some of you may not be familiar with it. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about the preserve itself. What is it? Um, it was set up for, these are, these are just the basics here. I could give an entire presentation on the history of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve and the Balcones Canyonlands Conservation Plan that established it and underpins it. Um, but it was a historical achievement um, that protect multiple endangered species in one plan while allowing development to can occur in a major urban area. And in that regard, it was the first of its kind and a national model. Uh, these are the species here, some of the species right here that are listed in our permit to be protected in the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Um, and this has been in existence since about 1996 is when the permit was approved. Um, and in case you're not familiar with the Balcones Canyon Preserve and you don't know where it is, this is where it is. Uh, it is in the western part of Travis County. The light green areas on the map are the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Uh, you can see a list of the public lands. Many public lands were incorporated into the preserve uh, if they had endangered species habitat and also some areas that are not exactly, not quite public areas, such as Travis Audubon's Baker Sanctuary. It is a part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. The dark blue area on the map is the area covered by the permit. So anybody who ha has property there who has endangered species habitat, have, now that we have this permit in place, they can develop their property. They can wipe out endangered species habitat with certain qualifications, including that they pay a mitigation fee to help purchase and sustain the lands of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. So it was a, a, a deal that was made to preserve endangered species and their habitat while allowing development to continue in the rest of, the, of Western Travis County. Um, so you've probably been there if you've been to these places. Um, you may not, you, you probably recognize that a lot of that area is forested and it's for good reason. Uh, now we have eight listed species uh, and 27 species that we thought could be listed in the future. Uh, you might think um, that we would be evenly distributing the acreage among those species. And that is not the case. Uh, the reason is uh, the karst species, six of the listed species and 25 of the uh, species of concern are karst species and they require protection of caves and the surface area that feeds those caves. So they're usually small patches. They're generally not counted in the, the, the whole 30,000 acres there. That acreage is counted somewhat separately. Um, so um, it's primarily the two birds and the two plant species of concern um, that are the above ground acreage that make up the preserve. Uh, the black cap vireo is at the eastern edge of its range here. It probably was always fairly limited in its range in this area since it likes shrublands and most of the land in this area did grow up into forest in most cases. Um, so there probably were never a lot of black cap vireos in this area. Their range, uh, their, their habitat is much more extensive in western parts of Texas and in Oklahoma and uh, Mexico. Um, so we concentrate here, the bulk of the acreage on the preserve is dedicated to the golden cheek warbler. Um, golden cheek warblers are forest interior species. They large, need large patches of forest or woodland uh, and I'll use those terms interchangeably. They technically are not interchangeable, um, 
but definitions vary. Woodland patch, uh, woodland forest can be determined by percent canopy cover or height of the trees. I usually consider it in terms of canopy cover, in which case, if it's 70% or greater, it should be considered forest, which is why I call, call this presentation about forests as opposed to woodland, since that is the primary habitat for golden cheek warblers. And they occur in the largest, least fragmented forest patches. Um, we're talking generally hundreds of acres. Um, they rarely uh, occur uh, in, in really small patches and they, have no, they are not successful at breeding in anything, certainly nothing less than 35 acres. It must be much larger than that to, be, to sustain a colony. Um, but not just golden cheek warblers are supported in this area. There are also uh, many plants, native forest plants. Several of them are endemic to Texas and some of them narrowly just to the Edwards Plateau. It is also a unique community that's a meeting place of flora from the southeast to southwest of Mexico. So we have a, a unique community here that you really can't find uh, elsewhere except on the eastern edge of the Edwards Plateau. So going into about the forest, the forest though is not, I'm having trouble there, there we go. Forest is not, uh, this, this is what the preserve looks like. It's uh, mostly wooded. Uh, there, are, there aren't a lot of open areas in, in much of the preserve. Um, and it, it's in many places it looks like this, it's dominated by ash juniper. Um, this is kind of a late spring, early summer photograph here, so it's kind of hard to tell the other trees. I think we've got a live oak over here and probably a Texas red oak over here, but the bulk of the canopy is ash juniper. But there are other places on the preserve that looks like this, where the deciduous hardwood trees dominate the canopy. Uh, there are some ash junipers um, in the lower center section of, of the photograph here and here and here and in the center part of the photograph. Can you, I hope you can see my cursor here. Uh, there are also some in the, on the far slope, you can see some junipers there and a live oak here in the foreground. But most of the trees in this picture that you see, uh, the kind of medium green are probably cedar elms. The very light green are Texas red oak and Spanish oak. Um, and so right here you have the two major forest communities of the Bacconis Preserve that I'll be talking about. Now, of course, it isn't a sharp dividing line between those two. There can be a, a gradient between them. I and mean, a lot of it depends upon where seeds land and they're able to take root. Um, if a, a deciduous tree is able to grow in, um, well, get into the different types of, of forest here in a moment. Um, but the forest varies a great deal across the preserve based upon several factors, including whether the area is an upland or bottomland or it's a slope, the degree of the slope and the aspect. Aspect means which direction the slope faces, whether it's to the east, the south, the north, or the west, uh, the type of soils and what bedrock underlies them, and where the locations of seeps and springs are, um, and also the history of human use of the land and what kind of disturbance there have been. And the two primary types of forest are broken up by which are drier, which are generally the ash juniper dominated forests. They're usually in south, on south and west facing slopes and on ridge tops where they're more exposed to the sun for longer hours of the day. They're also exposed maybe to more wind, so they tend to dry out compared to the more mesic uh, or moist areas that are dominated by Texas red oak in our area. In other parts of the plateau, they may be dominated by Texas ash, cedar elm, other species of oaks. But in this area, Texas red oak is, is the predominant species uh, in most of those areas. And that's canyon heads and bottoms, slopes that face north and east, seep zones, any place where you have more water or where the, the, the land is protected a little bit more from the sun. Okay, so I wanted to go into the first of these, which is actually a little less common, but more diverse. That's the flora of the mesic canyons, and by mesic I mean moist. There's more moisture there. It's not as xeric, that's a drier environment, 
um, but it's also not saturated. That's a, that's a term, the term for that is hydric, and we don't have much of that on the preserve. You'll find it in East Texas, of course, but you won't find a lot of it in this area. Uh, so it's mostly mesic and more xeric forests. But the mesic forests tend to have more diversity. Um, they have a variety, even in the canopy, there are many different trees. Texas red oak may dominate in most places, but there are several other trees. Cedar elm can be fairly dominant. The others are usually just a few in the canopy. They're not dominant trees, but they're important um, for the diversity of the forest. Um, and then there are also, underneath those trees, there's a good diversity of understory trees and shrubs, more so than in the dry forest. Um, and these are typical species you'll find in the understory. I'm using the term indicator species um, as meaning kind of a marker species, a, a species that if you find it, it's a good indication that this is the kind of forest you're in. Um, it means characteristic of, or species that's found either exclusively in that habitat, or it's primarily in that kind of a forest. Uh, you find it few, not as much in other areas, you'll find it primarily here. Um, so wafer ash and yopon, I say, are not indicator species because they can be found in drier environments, um, maybe just as commonly as in the more mesic forest. But red buckeye, if I see a red buckeye, it's going to be a mesic forest. Uh, I, it's very rare to see one of those in a dry juniper dominated forest. Um, so because it needs a lot more moisture. It's a plant more of East Texas affinities. Um, and so it's not as likely to be found in drier areas. And I want to go into some of the specialized species. These are, these are not species that you may have heard of at all. Um, you may not be able to find them in a nursery, uh, but they're distinctive to our area. In many cases have their very limited range. The, the plant on the left in particular, Heller's marble seed, um, is known from only eight counties in Texas. That's its entire world range. And all of that is on the Edwards Plateau or the adjacent Lampasas Cut Plain uh, to the north. Um, it's a common plant, if you're familiar with the plants of Baker Sanctuary, you go into the North Canyon of Baker Sanctuary at least. I'm not as familiar with South Canyon. I don't know, I haven't been there in a few years, so I don't know if it's as common there. But it's a very common plant in the bottomlands of the North Canyon of Baker Sanctuary. Uh, it's a member of the forget-me-not family. There is a similar species that's found more widely, but Heller's marble seed is very distinctive to our area. Uh, giant spider wart is not is probably endemic to Texas. There, uh, most records are in the eastern plateau and the cut plain to the north. Some are scattered in East Texas. There is a report of a population in Louisiana, but uh, it may have originated from cultivated plants. Giant spider wart is we have several spider warts in our area. They all have the three petals uh, that are purple to blue, sometimes to pink. Um, there may be some white varieties, um, but if it is more than a foot tall, it is probably this one. This is the one that grows in limestone, uh, at the base of limestone cliffs, um, and uh, it can, can have a kind of a pinkish look to it, um, but it's, um, one of the more striking of our uh, native, native flowers. Also in this area, um, you can see a couple of other bottom land, uh, canyon bottom plants, uh, Drummond's, Drummond's Ruellia. There are four or five other species of Ruellias, also called wild petunias. There's also some non-native variety. You think of the Mexican petunia as a rel relation. It sometimes escapes into the wild. Um, Drummond's Ruellia is, though, limited to only 18 counties in Texas. Um, it's distinguished by having these really broad leaves that are disappearing as I'm doing this here. Okay, rather broad leaves with a fairly long petiole, the long leaf stalk there, and the flowers are in the leaf axils. They're not generally at the top of the plant. Uh, some of the other Ruellias, all the flowers are concentrated at the top. Um, another plant that's found in this area is a very striking scarlet leather flower. It's a vine. Um, it's in the clematis genus. 
Um, it's a garden, uh, garden variety. There are garden variety clematis, but um, this one is different from many of the garden variety clematis in that the flowers, the petals are actually very thick and leathery. Uh, they open only as far as you see in the photograph there. Um, they are a striking red color. There is a variety that's found farther west on the plateau that has red interior. Ours have a white interior to the flower. Uh, there's another species of pitcher plant, uh, 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 leather flower uh, called pitcher's leather flower or purple leather flower that is entirely dark purple. Um, but uh, this is the one that's endemic to um, our area. It's found in only 16 counties in Texas and it, it can grow in, in more upland, drier areas, but it tends to prefer deeper soils. So it's more often found in lowlands. Uh, another couple of species that are not necessarily endemic. Uh, this variety of silk tassel, um, Garia oveda, is found pretty widely, but Lindheimeri variety is, is uh, uh, more local, but it does range into Coahuila and Nuevo Leon down in Mexico. Uh, so it's not entirely endemic, but it's a very characteristic shrub in the understory of a mesic forest. Uh, without the, the flowers are not really showy. They tend to come out early and they're silky, which is how they got the name silk tassel. Uh, it's evergreen um, and it could be used potentially as an ornamental. I don't know that it has been done so very much yet because of its evergreen quality. Um, false day flower um, has that bizarre looking face there. Um, it is, uh, it's an annual plant that's a bit more wide ranging. Um, it's found both on the plateau and the cut plain to the north, but also in south and east central Texas. There is a record from Durango, Mexico, but it's really distinctive for our area. You can see it in large numbers in many places uh, in, uh, in the Mesic Forest. Uh, then on to a couple of uh, some of the meeting ground kind of plants. These are species that uh, these three here are found fairly widely in East Texas and in many cases all the way to the East Coast, um, but we're at the extreme western edge of the range here. They, they need really moist conditions and they're really pushing their limits by growing in this area. Green Dragon, of course, is similar to the, the Jack in the Pulpit. It's our, it's our representative of that, the Arum family, uh, of which the Jack in the Pulpit is a member. Spice Bush, of course, the leaves are not always that yellow. That's fall colors there. Um, it's usually a fairly nondescript colored uh, leaf. If we had more of them, we may be able to host populations of the spice bush swallowtail whose larvae feed upon them, but I don't believe that butterfly occurs here because we don't have enough of this plant to support it. Um, but not only plants from the east, we also get plants from the west um, that are at the eastern edge of the range. And Texas milkweed is a stunning representative of that. If you are not familiar with that plant, um, and it can be difficult to find that one in the nurseries, but it is snow white. It, it is like a beacon on the forest floor when it blooms in June after all the leaves have come out on the canopy trees. Uh, it's a really striking plant. Where you have moisture, you have better chances for ferns. Uh, ferns need damp conditions in order to, to reproduce since the sperm must swim across a wet surface in order to fertilize an egg. So that has to be in moist areas so they have enough water in order, in order to reproduce. Um, so they're more likely to be found in the mesic forest. We don't have any endemic ferns, uh, endemic to our area. All of them are wide ranging, but some of them, it's, it's an interesting mix from the east, west, north, and south. Um, these three here are all pretty wide ranging throughout, uh, through much of Texas um, and beyond. Um, Alabama lip fern is probably the most widespread on the preserve because it can tolerate drier conditions. The other two need a little bit wetter conditions to survive. But then we have these other three species, if they're gonna come up. Uh, Lindheimer's maiden fern, otherwise known as shield fern, uh, or Lindheimer shield fern. Um, this variety um, of the species is found only to our west. So we are at the extreme eastern edge of its range. There is a look-alike species, um, the southern shield fern, Philipterus kuntii, which is found in East Texas, as far west as Bastrop County and maybe even into Travis County. Um, 
but this is the farthest extent of its range to the east for this particular variety of the other species. Um, resurrection fern, we're actually an outlier for that. It's very rare in Travis County, a uh, few, few records at all. This is uh, a colony I found on a log in a remote canyon of the preserve. They usually grow on logs or rocks. Um, it's also called sometimes gray or little gray polypody, I think is another name for it. Um, uh, but we have very few records of it. Uh, it's a representative of the eastern flora. And Mexican fern, as you might expect from the name, is representative from the south. Uh, Travis and Williamson County, Travis County, is about the northeast corner of its range. It's been found in Austin County near toward Houston. Um, but this is about as far northeast it, as it grows. Um, and you can find it in fairly uh, abundant you know, along the Barton Creek Greenbelt uh, in the canyon, uh, at the base of cliffs in the canyons. Um, so um, it's, it's a distinctive member of our flora that you can't find farther north. Moving into a niche community that you can find um, sometimes within the mesic forests, um, are the flora of shaded limestone walls and boulders. Um, these are the hanging gardens, I like to call them. Um, it's some of the most iconic landscapes of the Edwards Plateau in my mind. Um, the, those rock walls, when they're not exposed to the sun, are pretty good at retaining moisture. They also protect the, the plants from wind um, and uh, sun if they face the right direction. The vertical walls and the tight root spaces provide some constraints, but they also limit competition. So plants who can get a root hold in there won't have to deal with any competition from other plants. Uh, and there are some plants that are particularly distinctive to this little tiny niche um, in our uh, landscape. One of the most striking, of course, is the wild columbine, which as the name suggests, it's not an endemic plant. It grows all the way up to Canada. Um, but we are pushing the limits of its endurance in this area. We are so dry, but it is able to find a niche in those little uh, shaded walls and boulders uh, of our limestone canyons. Along with them, Mexican buckeye. Um, again, it's, it ranges quite widely elsewhere in Texas. You can find it even down in South Texas, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, where it grows on shell ridges. Uh, which are probably similar calcareous kind of growing condition, alkaline condition. Um, but it really does like limestone walls in our area. You can find it elsewhere in woodlands here, but it's particularly notable on those limestone walls. Um, and then two of the other ferns here that are considered epipetric, meaning they grow on the surfaces of rocks. And that's primarily the only places I see them. Um, black stem spleenwort is common throughout the southeastern U.S., but not in East Texas. Um, it's, it's in East Texas, there's a similar species called ebony spleenwort. So we are kind of sort of at the eastern edge of its range here, even though it grows in the southeastern U.S. as well. Um, powdery cloak fern is really has a strange range it's not found in East Texas or West Texas or South Texas, but it ranges north to Nebraska and Illinois. So this is one that comes in from the north. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's an interesting fern. If you've never seen it, that's about the size of it. it you could usually fit in the palm of your hand. Um, the underside of the leaves has a scaly white um, farina, it's called that if you press the leaf, the, the frond against a, a sweaty skin and then take it away, it will leave the imprint, the, some of the white farina will come off and leave the imprint of the frond on your hand. It's kind of a pretty uh, interesting plant that, that grows in our, in our canyons. We do have a couple of endemics that are particularly prone to uh, growing in the limestone boulders. And one is two flower anemone. Um, you probably know its co cousin, um, the windflower anemone or 10 petal anemone um, that can have a range of colors from white to lavender to purple and sometimes pink. 
uh, in any colony. Um, but it grows in uh, prairie areas, lawns, areas that are exposed to sun. It needs a lot of sun generally to be able to, to thrive. Two flower anemone is the opposite. It grows in shaded areas. You won't find it in much sun. Um, and it is almost always on limestone boulders. I rarely see it growing on the ground around those boulders, um, but it, it frequently grows on the boulders themselves. Um, they don't usually have purple flowers. They're usually white. I've never seen any color other than white. I've heard that there are. Um, so it's distinctive that way and it's habitat choice, but it's also distinctive in that uh, wind flowers have one flower per stalk. Two flower anemone have, as you can see on this, this uh, plant here with a mostly faded older bloom, there's a newer bloom coming off of the same stalk. Um, and you'll see that most of these others, they, they bloom in asynchronously. You don't usually have two flowers in full bloom on the same stalk at the same time. One is usually fades before the other one starts. Um, but they're always, or almost always going to have those two uh, flower stalks per stalk, per, per plant. Another plant that you'll sometimes see in this environment is Romer Spurge. Uh, it's a tiny little plant, only about four inches tall. Um, it's this distinctive yellow green. Sometimes it can be kind of a mat uh, on the ground, uh, a fairly extensive colony. Um, these strange little flowers, it's in the spurge family. They, they tend to have kind of unusual shaped flowers. Um, the uh, sp spurge is found in only 10 counties um, in central Texas. Two flower anemone has an even more limited range. It's found in only eight. But even more limited than that is one of our species of concern. This is called Canyon Mock Orange. Um, I understand there's been some reclassification of this species, so it may not be found, or it may actually have been merged with what was used to be considered a separate species, the Texas uh, mock orange. Um, so it may not be as limited in its range because of that reclassification. But before that happened, it was known from only five counties, uh, Blanco, Comal, Hayes, Kendall, and uh, Travis. Uh, we have two main colonies on the preserve, and it is a very striking shrub that grows out of those little solution pockets in the limestone boulders. How they're able to grow in those environments is, is beyond me, it's astounding. Um, but they're able to grow, as you can see on the left photograph there, a full-size shrub out of those little tiny solution pockets. Um, and they bloom en masse, usually in April. The scent is, has been described as something like vanilla or maple syrup. Uh, it can be quite intoxicating um, uh, when you're near some of them, um, but it's a really distinctive shrub that is found only on the limestone canyons. I never see it growing on the ground. It's always on the, the limestone boulders and walls of this particular niche. And then there are some other plants that, while they're not endemic and they're not limited to the limestone walls, are very characteristic of it. Uh, shrubby bone set, you're probably familiar. If you're familiar with that plant at all, um, you probably will associate it often with rock walls, uh, limestone walls. If you're not familiar with it and you like butterflies, get to know it. Uh, because in October and November, this, this is the game. Um, this is the only place for butterflies to go uh, after freezes and frosts have killed a lot of other plants. Uh, the shrubby bone set will oftentimes continue to bloom in large sprays of white flowers, and they're very attractive to, to a lot of butterflies. Uh, cedar sage, of course, is very distinctive. It can be found in a lot of forested environments, but it particularly likes to seem to grow out of the limestone boulders. Uh, the other two plants, not very showy. Um, they're both members of the nettle family. Um, and the one on the right, you need to be careful, the, the bottom one you need to be careful of because it does have stinging hairs, like a lot of nettles do. Um, but the one on the top is actually has no stinging hairs um, and is actually forms extensive mats in places on the ground, uh, which you'll see in the next photograph. Um, it also has a, dis, uh, a common name of cucumber plant and that comes from how it tastes. Uh, the leaves are edible and they have a very strong cucumber flavor. So that's, that's the more mesic two communities. 
I'd like to move now into the drier communities, more xeric, uh, that are distinctive for uh, ridge tops, south and west facing slopes. Um, and here you can see these are, I, I described these two plants as being in more mesic communities, but there's cedar sage, um, the brilliant red flowers that are growing here under the junipers. And then the gray green foliage that you can see in the lower left here, this is rock pellitory. Not very distinctive on its own or very, very eye-catching, but it is a, a common member of the forest flora. Now this particular habitat is often disparaged um, because, as they say, nothing grows under cedars. Now I have a tendency to um, doubt that uh, broad characterization. Uh, because there are some plants that do grow under cedars. They are not always just that, that showy, though there are exceptions. Uh, Texas madrone is a plant that primarily grows under junipers. Um, it can grow in open areas sometimes, but generally needs to have some sort of a nurse tree to get a start, and that's generally going to be a juniper. Um, so madrones are really distinctive uh, inhabitants of the juniper dominated forests of the ridge tops. But there are some other species too. And let's see if I can get them. Um, oh, uh, this is um, a, a scene that uh, kind of belies the idea that nothing grows under cedars, but this is also a springtime view. This is mostly rock pellitory underneath there, but there are a lot of other species growing underneath these trees. Um, and it can be quite lush but this is probably more typical. Um, however, even where you have a fairly sparse ground cover, many of the species here are either endemic to Texas or they're most abundant in this kind of habitat. They don't grow very well, in, they, don't grow, they don't compete with prairie plants in full sun, and they don't seem to do well um, where there's more shade in the more mesic forests. This is a fairly dappled sunlight. There's fairly, a uh, fairly good amount of sunlight comes through the juniper. Um, but in some of the more deciduous forests, there's much less sun. So there are some plants that are adapted to this area. And here's a set of four of them, um, a set of four endemic or near endemic or indicator plants. This isn't a particularly, this is not a photograph you would probably take. Um, the most showy thing on there is that little golden mushroom that's at the base of the rock. Um, but these, this set of four plants here is very interesting combination. It's, it's kind of indicative of what you'll find in a juniper community. Um, you have a couple of endemic plants, such as devil's shoestring. That's the long leaved plant you see on the left side. The Texas red oak that we've talked about, uh, the seedlings will grow up in this, this environment. We'll talk some more about the two endemics, uh, Devil's Shoestring and Lindheimer Crownbeard. Um, I don't have a good photograph other than this for cedar rosette grass. It's not endemic. It has a really wide range all the way down to Guatemala. But in our area, it is primarily found under junipers. So this is a, and it can actually be one of the more common species on the ground underneath junipers. And other places it's not. So now I'm going to take a closer look at some of these dry forest endemics, starting with that one on the left there. This is devil's shoestring. Um, it is one of the basket grasses. We have a couple of those in central Texas, um, the, the Nolina genus. Uh, you may be more familiar with Sacahuista, which is its cousin. Um, they have very similar growth forms. They'll both be found in juniper woods. They'll both also be found in, in open sunny ridges or sunny rock ledges. You can find both in those areas. Um, Sacahuista is recognizable. It has a more wide, it's more wide ranging. Um, it's recognizable by the flower clusters and where they are. Sacahuista, the flower clusters stay down in among the leaves or grow just barely above the leaves. They don't have the long flower stalk, the tall flower stalk of devil's shoestring over here on the left. Uh, and that's the easiest way to recognize the two of them. Um, so devil's shoestring is known from only 13 counties in Texas, so it's ours. 
uh, nobody else have it, has it. And um, according to one um, uh, quotation from the Illustrated Flora of East Texas, it's, it's becoming, it's quite infrequent and becoming more so as its habitat is destroyed through development and overgrazing. Um, it will grow in areas where cattle can graze it, but at least on the preserve, it doesn't have to be concerned about that. So we are a refuge for this uh, species of fairly limited range. So it's quite common, it has a very limited range. Uh, another one that's a bit more showy is Lindheimer crownbeard. Uh, if you're not familiar with this plant, you may be familiar with two of its cousins, frostweed. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't look anything really like frostweed, uh, which has white flowers that are clustered in a flat top cluster at the top of a long straight stalk, kind of like the plant on the right there. Um, but not like the ones on the left. Um, it does look a bit more like its other cousin in our area called Calpen daisy. Calpen daisy, though, is a plant of disturbed areas such as, wait for it, cowpens. Um, so you find it more often around human habitations. Uh, Lindheimer crownbeard is uh, a plant of forests. Um, it can grow in open areas if the trees have been cleared and they've already been established, uh, but it generally does not grow in prairie areas. Um, it has a really big flower head, like about two inches across, a very showy plant. And the most distinctive characteristic of the plant itself is that the leaves are very, very rough. They're like sandpaper. Um, you can distinguish it from cow pen daisy very easily just because of the roughness of the leaves. Um, and possibly because of that, characteristic. Deer don't like it. Um, now, I don't think the nurseries around here have been able to propagate it enough. I understand it can be difficult to propagate from seed, um, but it could be a really good ornamental plant in this area if it could be developed uh, uh, propagation. Um, then there are several others that are uh, found on xeric uh, juniper woodlands. Twistleaf yucca is known from very few counties, uh, only Let's see if I got my cheat sheet here. About 18 to 20 counties in Texas. Of course, it can be found on exposed ledges as well. Um, but it may be that the plants, that, particularly with the deer population being very high, the plants that bloom are more likely to be the ones under tree cover. Deer love these things. Um, I have to put uh, cages around the yuccas in my own yard to keep the deer from eating them. It's like cotton candy to them or something. Um, because they could completely strip all the, the, the flowers from a plant and it would not have a chance to reproduce. So it may well be that in, in open areas, uh, if the deer population is too high, they will not reproduce so well, but the ones in the wooded areas may. Um, other species that are endemic, uh, plateau milk vine, found in only 12 counties in central Texas. Um, it's a close cousin, of course, of the pearl milkweed vine um, that has a flatter uh, uh, flower. This one has a little bit more saucer shaped. It curls up, the petals curl up toward the tips a little bit. And of course this doesn't have the distinctive pearl in the center of the flower like the pearl milkweed does. Um, but it does have the very fine delicate green striping on the, on the petals of that species as well. Um, it's often kinds of trail, it trails along the ground under juniper trees, so it looks like those oak leaves in this particular case. Um, but it's a distinctive plant of that community, as is the seven-leaf creeper, which looks, of course, very much like Virginia creeper, except it has seven leaves. Um, oftentimes, it does not have seven. It has only six, um, and I found, disturbingly, a lot of plants will have only five leaflets, and I have to search sometimes to find a leaf that has seven leaflets. Um, it does have a tendency to have that more jagged toothing uh, toward the tip of the, the leaflet than Virginia creeper, but they tend to overlap, I think, in that characteristic. So uh, it's somewhat variable. It can become kind of confusing at times. Um, seven leaf creeper is, is again an endemic known from only 23 counties in Texas. And then this one's probably the most limited in its range at all. Texas Samaria is known from only 10 counties. It's a snapdragon relative, um, an annual. Uh, fairly weak stems that, that uh, tend to grow in more open, sunny spots 
in the middle of juniper forest uh, on ledges and such. Um, but uh, it's a distinctive member of our flora as well. And then you got to be really a bio nerd to get into these two. Uh, Plateau silver bush, it's also called tall wild mercury. I think that's a better name. I don't think there's anything really silvery about it, uh, but it's a distinctive plant that's found only in 16 counties on the Edwards Plateau and the adjacent North Central Texas. It's a very, very characteristic plant of these juniper forests. Not showy at all, uh, but it's there. And Buckley tridens is a grass. Um, this is a pretty characteristic look at one of them right here. It has very uh, spare branching that, in which the spikelets hug the branches very tightly. Um, characteristic, if you can see down near my thumb here, is a little spur branch off the main branch that goes off at a 90 degree angle. That's characteristic of Buckley tridents. It's known from only 12 counties on the plateau and the adjacent uh, Lampasas cut plain. I see it only under juniper. It does not compete well with prairie grasses and it apparently doesn't do well in shade. So it, it won't grow in those environments. There are also some species that I had to include here. They're near endemic though. Uh, I once included them as endemic species, but now they have apparently have been discovered uh, to range into Mexico. Um, so they're not entirely restricted to Texas. Uh, but this is um, Colorado Venus looking glass, sometimes called Western Venus looking glass. It is named for the Colorado River here in Texas, uh, not the one that goes through the Grand Canyon. Um, and it's an annual again, very striking plant, very showy, blooms in April to May, uh, very, very catch, catches the eye when you see it growing. This, the other one, however, is not very eye-catching, Blackfoot Spurge. It's a wispy little plant that only grows like maybe a foot tall, tiny little flower, uh, but it's very distinctive of the flora of the juniper forest. And then there's some other uh, species that are not endemic, uh, but they are especially common in juniper woods um, and they're possibly indicators of those environments. Cedar sedge can be a grassy mat uh, underneath uh, uh, in a juniper forest. It, it can form what looks like the grass understory covering much of the, the uh, ground in a juniper forest, but it is actually a sedge. Uh, and I already mentioned cedar rosette grass. Um, these other plants here, uh, are especially frequent in uh, uh, juniper forest. Um, and then there's uh, a few others. Uh, white rock lettuce that looks like a dandelion except it's white uh, and they can form small colonies in the juniper forest. Bush clover will be bloom blooming here in a couple of months. Um, sprawls on the ground. Uh, uh, pink flowered pea that grows in the juniper forest. And then there's the red asparagus, as they're sometimes called. Uh, it is a group of orchids in the Hexelectris genus um, that are particularly partial to juniper and oak forests. Uh, they, the leaves that you see there at the base are actually poison ivy leaves. They do not have green leaves. They don't have significant leaves at all, and they have no green coloring because they have no, they do not have chlorophyll. They are sap, saprophytic microtrophic, which means they have a symbiotic relation, symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi that grow on and in the roots of junipers and oaks. Uh, so they are generally have a close relationship with the roots of trees, especially junipers. Some, some, some of them also may be with oaks and there are at least Four species that I'm aware of on the preserve, there may be a fifth that I haven't seen, uh, but has been reported in Travis County. The one you're seeing here, I believe, is probably Hexelectris arizonicus. It's a recently described species or recently split off. Um, it is characterized by being really tall, uh, usually a foot and a half tall stalk, and the flowers generally do not open. They are uh, cleistogamous. They have a tendency to self-fertilizing. So they frequently do not open. So this is as much of a show as you get. There are others, however, where the flowers do open. 
and sometimes you'll get a big display like this. This is the biggest display I've ever seen. This is right in our office grounds. Um, this is the probably the more widespread, the most widespread of the hex electrics in our area, the spiked crested coral root. Um, it has a tendency to have a golden color. Here's a close up of that cluster there. The background color of the flowers is kind of a golden tan with uh, purplish stripes, uh, except for the lower lip, which is white with magenta stripes. Um, and again, this one also will grow mm, a foot and a half tall, is pretty typical. Um, other species, another species that grows here is the glass mountains crested coral root, Hexelectris nitida, which means shining. Um, the flower you may be able to see there, a little tiny flower there, does not have the stripes. It, the stem tends to be more of a pinkish purple rather than a golden color. Um, and uh, the lower lip though is, is still white with magenta stripes. Um, and it's a more delicate plant. And then there was this one that we discovered. Uh, this dazzling species was first found um, it was thought to be restricted to Western Texas. Um, about a decade ago, there was one found in Dallas County. Um, but this one here was just discovered by one of our staff biologists 10 years ago. Um, and so this was the first record for the, the county. Uh, it's a stunning plant um, and that grows almost entirely only under junipers and juniper oak forests. All right, well, I have a little bit of time here, I think, I hope. Wanted to go into one last special niche, and that is the niche held by one of our species. Of, it's actually not a species of concern. It is a candidate species for listing. It's a very rare plant called Bracted Twist Flower. If you have not seen it, um, it has a limited range of only about four or five counties, only on the plateau. It's not on our permit, uh, but it is a candidate uh, for listing. And the city of Austin and other landowners have a memorandum of agreement to protect the species in its habitat wherever it occurs. So it is a protected species. We're hoping it will get endangered species listing uh, protection as well, but at least it does have protection on city property. Um, we do an annual census of the known populations on city property in late April and early May. If you're interested, um, uh, uh, you can check with me. Uh, I'll get it through Travis Audubon if, they, if you want to contact Travis Audubon if you can't reach me. Um, but we have volunteers who help us with um, searches um, on Mount Bunnell is one of the populations we have. And another one is on Barton Creek. I will caution though that you need to be in pretty good physical condition. It's not a walk in the park where Mark Sanders is standing there. He's one of my colleagues. That looks like it's pretty easy. Um, I have had more muscle strain from monitoring these things than I have from monitoring golden cheek warblers. Um, so it's um, it, because you're standing on oftentimes trying to walk around steep slopes without stepping on plants. Um, and it can be kind of a challenge. Um, Bracted twist flower grows anywhere, is usually about a foot to two feet tall, but I've seen them blooming when they're only two inches tall. And I've also seen giants that were head high, that were five feet tall. So they're very variable. It's an annual, which means every species uh, has to grow from seed, bloom, and produce seed again in one year's time, taking advantage of limited suitable conditions. It is a forest species on the preserve, but elsewhere it grows in full sun. And part of the reason I say it's a mystery plant um, is that it's kind of a mystery why it grows, where it grows, and not elsewhere. It has a very narrow band that's pretty much restricted to between Mopac and Loop 360 through much of Austin. Um, and it doesn't seem to grow anywhere beyond that. Um, it tends to grow on convex slopes that are facing south to the west, so it's hotter and drier, which probably limits, limits some of the competition from other plants, but there are some plants that tend to grow with it. 
um, if not range-wide, uh, we haven't found any indicator species range-wide that's always found with it. But in the Austin area, there are some. Uh, well, at least it seems to be that there are some species that found are rarely on, encountered on the preserve except where Bracted Twist Flower is. Uh, one of these, uh, and many of these are of southern uh, ranges that are near their limited, the northeast limits of their range. One of those is this species that uh, it's listed as Peonia. I pretend to, I prefer to accent that next to the last syllable, Peonia, um, stemless Peresia, meaning the the flower stalks do not have leaves. All of the flowers and leaves arrive, arise from the center, the, the base of the plant. So there's no stem. Um, it can be found in juniper forest where there is no twist flower, but it's particularly common where we have twist flower. And in particular, it's in combination with other species uh, around twist flowers. It's a member of the sunflower family. Um, and it has only ray flowers, um, but the ray flowers are two lobed, um, unlike most other ray flowers like dandelion or something like that. So it gives it a kind of chrysanthemum type look to it. And it is found sometimes in association with this little vine, which is actually a milkweed called thicket thread vine. Um, it's also sometimes called bearded swallow wart for the very fuzzy petals, there's are tiny little flowers. They're only like about a quarter inch across. Um, but this is a plant that generally tends to like kind of more moist soils, so I can find it in a lot of dry areas. I don't find it in juniper forest, except where there's Bracta twist flower. Um, and generally, I do not find th thicket thread vine and Paeonia growing together, except in areas that are at least suitable for Bracta twist flower. And then there are a couple of other, there are a trio of other plants that are, again, more Mexican species, um, uh, like the uh, Paeonia is more of a southern species, south and western species. Uh, Mouse's ear, also called Southwest Bernardia, is a South Texas shrub, which is near the northern limits of its range here, um, northeast limits of its range. It ranges to Galveston, Lavaca, Travis, and Lampasas counties. Everything else is farther south and west. Um, this interesting little shrub, it's a really spindly little shrub. It can grow to three feet tall um, and um, sometimes called Texas fan for that propeller shaped flower, very delicate little purple flower uh, that grows on this tiny, this little spindly shrub. Um, and again, this is a species of south and west Texas found sparingly north to Travis and Williamson counties. And then a fern that I tend to call, I call zigzag cliff break because of the zigzag stem, Pelea oveda. It's also called ovate leaf cliff, cliff break. Again, this is a, uh, a south, southern plant found in the southeast or southwest. Uh, it ranges as far as Burnett, Hayes, Comal, and, and Bayer counties, as well as Travis County. You can see it in abundance in Barton Creek Greenbelt uh, along the rock walls. Um, but again, these five species almost never grow together except where we see bracted twist flower. So there's a, there's a niche involved there. We can't define it necessarily exactly what it is, but there seems to be something that all of these plants seem to like. And with that, I've run rather long here. I will wrap up and uh, just say thank you for listening to me ramble on and on and on. It's a subject I really enjoy talking about because I think it's very interesting and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Bill. So we do have some questions for you. One of our viewers is wondering, do you ever collect the seed from the bracted twist flower? We have. Um, we actually worked in association with uh, Dr. Alan Pepper. Um, I can't remember which university he worked for at the time, but he, um, did, actually, I'm sorry, no, he was collecting uh, DNA samples uh, from them. But we also worked with uh, a woman from Texas Department of Natural Resources uh, before she moved on to a different location. Um, and we did collect uh, like one seventh of the seeds. Uh, we wanted to, like if, we, if uh, you had seven 
seed pods, they're called saliques, on one plant, we would collect one of those so that we wouldn't dis to disrupt the seed source too much for that continuation of that colony. Um, and I believe we, uh, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center was keeping those seeds. That's, that was what my understanding was at the time. That was several years ago. Okay, thank you. And we do want to ask, um, what is what was your spark bird or the the bird that oh, oh, right. birding? <laughs> um, you know that's really difficult to say because I started birding um, more like fifty years ago, so um, I don't remember very well. Um, I, I do remember it was more my father was my spark rather than any particular bird because he okay. was interested in birds and we went out birding together sharing one pair of binoculars. That's fun. <laughs> um, the warblers are definitely among my favorites. Um, the spring migration in Ohio where I grew up was, there was just a, a, a deluge of warblers. Uh, 30, 40 species of warblers would come through every year and I was dazzled. Wow. Still. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Bill. It looks like that is all the time we have for today. Um, sadly, <laughs> yes, I had more I could do, but I just ramble on too much. Thank you so much. You're good. Thank you. This has been so informative. Um, so thank you to everyone who for joining us today. Um, this presentation will be posted on the Travis Audubon YouTube page. And with that, we would like to conclude our presentation. So take care and be well. Bye. Thank you. Bye.